So yeah, welcome everyone again to session seven of the year uh, for Investing 101, but session two of the new semester, session two of the new course that we're kind of rolling out over six weeks. Um, and we're really excited to have you here. It's amazing to see so many new names. Um, I am going to pass you over to Henry now to basically get started, lead the session because we don't want to keep you too long tonight. And then we're going to move over after Henry to, to Catherine, who's going to go into a bit of a live demonstration about technical analysis, which is very exciting and a first for us. So um, yeah, Henry, take it away. Cool, cool. Uh, well, very warm welcome, guys. And again, great to see such high numbers. Um, anybody new? Anyone here completely new? Just give us a, a thumbs up. There's just a lot or, of new names. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Right, oh. How lovely to see. Well, it's good because we always have somebody new and it's nice to be able to get, you know, even this late in the academic year, still get new people involved with investing. So very warm welcome from all of us. Um, and let's get started. So what is on today? Uh, three key things. We're going to go over the basics of technical analysis. Uh, we focused on a lot of fundamental analysis from kind of last term. Today, we're gonna to do some basics on technicals. Uh, we're gonna explore some of the technical indicators and how to use them. Uh, and then I'm gonna pass over to Catherine and she's gonna go through uh, kind of a live demonstration, talk a bit about her trading uh, and how she uses price action, giving a uh, Bitcoin as an example, I believe, which is gonna be very good fun. Uh, every week we do a book uh, that you can win with our society, which is great. This week uh, is the Tower of Trading. I, I imagine a lot of people already have this book. It's uh, by Simon Ree. He was our first uh, guest speaker back in August. Um, and he was he's a very experienced financial professional and wrote a very good book on technical trading. So it, you know, if you if you enjoy the content in today's session, I'd thoroughly recommend picking up his book because he covers all of this and much, much more. Uh, as well, our, all of our sessions are recorded. So again, if you like what you see, hop over to our YouTube channel. Uh, this, as I said, this session will be uploaded on YouTube. Uh, this is our, our handle for our University of Birmingham Investment Society. Um, yeah, the videos on there do pretty well. So uh, get, just have a look on there if you want to kind of recap anything, because I appreciate this. is a, There might be a lot of new stuff for somebody who's a first timer. Um, and recently, I set up my own YouTube channel as well. I kind of go through basic financial stuff, do deep dives on stock analysis. So that's something you're interested in. Be sure to check that one out as well. But just some more resources for you guys out there. Without further ado... There's a disclaimer as always, just so we don't get sued. Um, fundamental versus technical. So as I mentioned last time with the deep dive on fundamental, this time we're gonna talk through the basics of technical. The main difference between these two for anyone who's not up to speed is fundamental is much more analyzing the real deep, um, tangible, real things behind a stock or an investment. It's un analyzing the business models, going through the financial statements, et cetera, et cetera. It's usually more synonymous with a long-term strategy. That's not always the case, but it's more investing in a business idea, uh, investing in something which you valued, et cetera, et cetera. Technical is much more looking at the chart, looking at how investors are behaving against a particular stock, using patterns to, to try and work out where you think the stock is going to go. And it's much more of a short-term strategy. So whilst both can be very, very good ways to invest your money, they're actually pretty different and can yield very different results. Uh, yeah, so technical, we'll be focusing on that one today. So which side are you on? I, I put this slide in because a lot of investors are usually one or the other. Uh, you get a lot of investors that are very much fundamentalists, a lot that just focus on the charts. And there are some people that shun the other side. Um, in investing, I think it's incredibly important that we're open-minded uh, when we're educating ourselves and actually focus on what works, you know, get rid of those preconceived notions about what we think might work or getting too attached to a particular idea and actually focus on the cold, hard, you know, what really, really works. Um, I, I think, you know, Gen Z, the younger generation, all of us, we're pretty good at being open-minded and kind of learning new concepts. I know a lot of older people are kind of set in their ways and this is this is the way to do it and you know if you've had a profitable investing strategy or whatever it is you know for 20 30 years that's absolutely great uh, but i'm just saying that it's always important to make your own decisions after you've really explored something and to always be open-minded with new concepts that you can potentially learn uh, in my personal experience i'm much more of a fundamental investor so the stuff we're talking about tonight is not really my 
investing speciality or where I focus most of my time on. However, I still actively use it in my investment decisions because I think there's a lot of benefit of doing so uh, and of learning a lot more about it as we kind of go. Um, and sometimes you have situations where they complement each other. That is an example that I'm going to show you in a minute. If anyone's got anything to add or any initial questions, David, please let me know. Yeah, nothing, nothing so far, to be honest. Uh, the one thing I will just add very quickly is that for the tower trading book giveaway that we're going to do, uh, you do need to stay till the end of the session and Ethan's going to randomly generate a winner uh, using a, a random generator then. So yeah, stick around and uh, yeah, Henry, feel free to carry on. What are we on? 66. That's sweet. Okay. Amazing. So, okay. The first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to kind of show an example of linking up fundamental and technical analysis. I just kind of wanted to, to bust this myth that you don't really have to be one or the other and kind of show an example where in my own experience, it actually worked in harmony. So back in mid 2020, I was trading airline stocks. Uh, I thought that the market had sold off too aggressively. Uh, everyone thought airlines were just going to completely vanish because of COVID and sure they were very heavily beat down, but I thought, there might have been an opportunity here to kind of go against the herd. Uh, and I, I thought people were being a bit too pessimistic on, uh, on airlines. So one of the companies I bought into was Southwest. It's a very high quality US airline. I did my fundamental research as usual. Uh, I built a valuation model. Um, don't, don't worry about any of the specifics of this now. It's basically just a, a model that I build based off fundamental analysis that helps me kind of value the shares. In fact, we've got some external speakers coming in next week to talk a bit more about valuation which is going to be very very exciting kind of doing a, a deep dive on how to really uh, quantitatively work out what a business is worth uh, so anyway i i did this model and i thought the shares were worth about 42 dollars um and then the interesting thing was i like to read morningstar's research reports they're basically just a very reputable american research broker and um interestingly they also valued the shares at $42. Uh, so there was some synonymity, if that's even a word, between my uh, fair valuation price and Morningstar's fair valuation price. And then I looked at the chart and th this is where the technicals come in. So I, I was looking at our valuations. I realized we we're kind of similar. And then I saw what you would call a resistance line or, or more of a resistance range that I've put on this chart. Very, very strong in this 38 to $42 range. Uh, and upon further inspection, I noticed a lot of other analysts had found price targets where they thought the stock would be worth in this range of $38 to $42. What this resistance line is effectively is, what, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for where the shares are going up, they're hitting some point in this range, and then there's some resistance there, which is causing them to bounce back down. Um, so if you look at the right hand side of the screen, the, the way that this happens, the actual technical reason why this is happening is you have a lot of investors who think the shares are worth X. In this case, it was about $40 with a little bit of leeway on the side. And therefore, a lot of investors will sell when the shares hit $40, particularly institutional investors. Uh, and South, uh, Southwest was three quarters owned by the institutions and they follow these price targets very, very closely. Either they actually generate the price targets themselves through their equity research team, or they buy research from somebody like Morningstar, uh, who then, you know, kind of give them some guidance on what they think the shares should be worth. And then obviously what will happen is those shares, when they get sold, they will flood into the market and that will create a load of supply of the shares and the shares won't really go any higher. And that creates this resistance line. Um, so, so basically that's, that's an example example of where you can kind of see technical and fundamental rallied up, married up together. Uh, you've got the fundamental of kind of valuing the shares, but then you have a lot of confidence that, that the shares are worth quite a specific amount. And you can actively see this is creating this kind of resistance area on the chart. Um, I mentioned support as well. Support is basically the, the opposite of resistance. So uh, you have a situation where shares will sell, but when, when they get down to a certain price level, people will start buying up. And usually you'll see this, this bottom bar where the shares are kind of bouncing up from. And there was also a support range on Southwest about from 31 to, to $35. You can, you can see the crash 
from the Southwest shares. It was absolutely insane. Look at the crash on the left. You had the initial COVID crash here, which was March. The, the main stock index has rallied back up here, but the, uh, the bearer sentiment on the airlines continued all the way down into May. Uh, what did it go from? About 60 to about $25. Absolutely crazy. Um, a little bit further evidence is that when I actually dived into the analyst price targets at a specific point in time, you can actually see, obviously, they cut their price targets when COVID happened, but the lowest that ever got was about this $38 to $42 range. And it actually sustained this range for a very, very long period of time. And that just gave me extra confidence that the kind of fundamentals of we think the shares are worth this, coupled with the resistance lines bouncing um, bouncing back down from kind of $40 to $42 where people were selling the shares gave me a lot of confidence that, that this is what the shares are worth. And you can also use the technical analysis to kind of see where the shares are going to go. Um, yeah, this is how you combine fundamental and technical analysis to help you improve your trading. Uh, has anybody got any questions? None in the, none in the uh, chat so far. But look, if, if anyone does, feel free just to drop us a message in the chat or um, turn on your mic and ask away. But yeah, uh, for now, carry on and then I'll, I'll let you know. Cool, cool. Um, right. So the next uh, very, very basic technical indicator we wanted to go through was uh, candlesticks. So you'll notice when you are looking at shares, you'll see a very basic line chart. This is what I have here is because it's so long term, I'm not really using candlesticks because I'm just trying to show the general trend of the stock. It's basically just a plotted line that kind of shows you the close of the stock every day. A candlestick will give you an immense more amount of detail on the stock. Um, you can have two types. You've got a bullish candlestick, which basically means the stock on that day, it went up. So it closed higher than it opened. And you have a bearish candlestick, which is usually in red, uh, which will kind of tell you that the stock closed lower than it opened or the share price went down. That is why you can see the same kind of um, diagrams here, except for the bullish, you've obviously got the open lower than the close because it went up. And for the bearish, you've got the open above the close because it went down. Um, so the open and the close are kind of marked by the, the ending of the thick bars. And then, but also throughout the day, you know, you can have a stock hit a particular high and then fall back down or have a particular low. So that's basically what this is. You know, you can have a stock that opened at $70 it closed at 72, but during the day, some point it might've reached 73. So in that case, you would have the open of the stock, again, $70 here. You'd have the close at $72 here, but then you would also have the kind of peak of the stock at $73 here. And if it, I don't know, it might've fallen to 69 throughout the day as well. And that's where you would kind of have the low point of the stock here. So candlesticks just, they basically give you some, some extra context if you're in technical trading, kind of shows you how volatile the stock was during a particular day, you know, how much it closed up or closed down. Was it very volatile and then closed back to the middle or was it kind of consistent? Um, that's basically what candlesticks tell you. Um, yeah, if you see a candlestick without any thick bar, uh, this is basically called a, called a doji. It, it basically means the stock traded flat during the day. So it opened at 70, it closed at 70. Obviously, these open and closes are the same, and therefore you wouldn't really see much of a thick bar. Anything to add, guys? Yeah, just that we've had, I've had one private question, which is I understand um, what candlesticks show us, but but why does it matter? Ah, hang on, I'm trying to get my trying to get my. Uh, just give me a sec. There we go. What is it? Well, I guess it's just like the reason that it matters is it it just gives you an extra bit of context, particularly when you're trading in the short term. Um, yeah, that's basically what I would say. Like, If you're looking at a very long-term graph and, it, and if you're more of an investor or if you, you, know, you value the company at kind of 60 uh, and it's trading in the market for 30, you're not, you're not too concerned about these short-term price movements. But if you're trading very short-term uh, and kind of every little cent matters. The candlesticks just very much help you to get to give some extra context, right? And they can also just give you the kind of flavor of how the stock is doing. You can give a quick glance at them and you can kind of see how volatile the, the stock is by, by seeing kind of the, the magnitude of 
the long bit of the candlestick compared to the thick bit. Um, and also the collars just just basically help to see whether the stock traded up or down in the day. So, so that's what I would say. I would say that they're most useful in conjunction with other technical strategies when you're trading short term. Lovely. Anything else to add, mate? No, nothing, nothing from me. Cool, cool. Uh, so I've just got a couple more technical indicators to add, and then we're going to hop over to, to Catherine for some price action examples. Uh, so, okay, so here's another very important um, technical uh, indicator. And this is also particularly interesting because it's something that a lot of institutions use, moving average lines. So these are basically indicators of momentum and they will basically tell you how much force a price has moved up or down recently. So you'll see we're at the front of these moving averages, you have something called a period, this number. It will basically tell you how, over how many periods it's tracked, it's tracking the price of the stock from. So moving average, clues in the name, it's an average of the X many periods. I've put here days, it's usually days. You could change your chart to hourly and you could get a 50 SMA would be an average of the last 50 hours. It basically just tells you, you know, is the stock above where the average trade has been over the past few days or is it below it? Uh, and obviously if it's above it, it's a signal of bullish momentum or positive momentum on the stock. If it's the other way around and it's below that moving average line, it's a sign of bearish momentum. Uh, I'll mention that there are, there are two different ones. Uh, the simple, basically, it applies equal weight to the past X many periods. So we can have a 50-day SMA, past 50 periods. It will measure the price equally, sum them all up, divided by 50. There's your 50 SMA line. Uh, but you can also get exponential, uh, which basically, the maths behind it is kind of complicated, but it will apply more weight to recent days. So what that would mean is obviously yesterday's price will have much more of an influence over, uh, compared to like 20 days ago. Um, and obviously the benefit of that would be if the latest price is awaited more, it might be able to tell you when the stock is changing its momentum much quicker. Um, so you, you can see here, we've got a, an example courtesy of Fidelity who kind of plotted this out. And I thought it was quite a nice example to, to put in. You can see with this stock, you, you can kind of see a trend where you've got the, when you've got the 200 simple moving average above the 50, i.e. the long-term momentum of the stock is above the short-term. So the short-term momentum is not as good. The stock has tended to fall. And then you can see where they kind of cross over. The short-term momentum, the 50 SMA takes over and the stock starts going back up. Um, so this is very, very specific to this stock and that there's no golden rule for any kind of technical analysis. But with this pattern specifically, it might be a good indicator if you're seeing the short term moving average above the long term moving average. That might signal a bullish trend, or at least it has done historically. If you see the shorter term moving average above the longer term moving average, that might signal a bearish trend. Um, there's something else called stacking, which I didn't want to go into too much detail here because it would just open up a whole kind of technical can of worms. But Simon Reed details that heavily in his book. And what he will do is he will basically stack loads of different moving averages on top of each other. So what he'll want to see is obviously the stock being kind of above them as bullish as possible. It's momentum being very, very high. And he'll want to see them in a pattern with the shorter term moving averages above the longer term moving averages. I think even in the book, he mentions to to make a rainbow, which like really, really helps to kind of indicate, you know, if you've got, if you've got your shortest moving average in red and then it goes orange, yellow, green, blue, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down to, uh, to violet and you, you have a rainbow formation, it will actually be a good practical indicator that there's positive momentum on the stock. Um, does anybody have any questions? I appreciate that's probably quite a lot to take in, in a, a short amount of time, but just to reiterate, you know, this is going on YouTube artists, you can rewatch it. And um, I would say that this is from a very uh, non-biased point of view, but Simon Ree's book is is like, what, five, 10 pounds? Um, and it explains it all so, so simply for, literally for beginners. Um, I found it really easy to understand and I cannot recommend it highly enough. And 
you know, if you are lucky, we will be giving it away to one of you later. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, just, I guess, uh, don't don't lose focus. Like, it's, it's a lot. But, um, Henry, I think you've done a really good job of explaining it, to be honest. And, um, yeah, rewatch it if you need to. Thank you. Uh, I'll say... Um... When I read investing books, you know, usually it's me sitting down, scribbling notes with a highlighter. And after two or three chapters, my brain is absolutely confuzzled. And it, it, will, it won't be a chore, but it's like it's like studying or working, right? Like it requires a lot of effort. You have to sit down, you have to focus. Simon Reeves' book is not like that. And you don't actually have many investing books, at least that I've read, that are really, really simple and like that. Like, David, you mentioned you read it in a weekend, right? Yeah, it, it is, really isn't like a paid promotion. <laughs> it's just <laughs> genuinely, genuinely a really good book. Um, so yeah, yeah, George just said- It, it was nice to just read something or look forward to reading something. Sorry, mate, repeat that. I think you froze up. So I was just going to say, George just said in the comments, the intelligent investor isn't fun. Yeah, I, I, I can, uh, I think from memory, yeah, it, it wasn't fun. It's a long, it's a long book, old, old language, but uh, this, it's is, this like, is different. It's like having your grandfather kind of sit you down and kind of read you, read you it, you know, just in the middle of winter on a fire in a slow, dreary voice. And like, I don't want to shun that book too much because there's a lot of good content in it, but you really do have to sit down and focus. And uh, anyone who's read The Intelligent Investor in a weekend, I applaud you. But reading Simon Reed's book in the weekend is really straightforward and you, you, you won't be able to put it down. And you know, you know what I would say, because we've got the, uh, because we did the event, with him back in august and we've got the recording on youtube it might be worth checking that as well if you're interested because he's, he goes into a bit more detail about this talks about like his uh i guess his motivation behind writing the book and like why he believes these price actions are important and why he believes these kind of technical indicators are also important and um yeah it's probably good to hear from him as well so that's my suggestion we don't have any comments though or uh, questions so yeah all we all well um I'm going to hand over to Catherine shortly, but just before I kind of finish up going through those technical indicators, I just wanted to say that similar to fundamental, there's nothing in investing that's an absolute and there's nothing that necessarily predicts uh, the future stock price. So two little bits of wisdom I wanted to leave you with is number one, always research what is happening on a fundamental level. In fact, I think Simon Ree mentioned this in his book as well. Technical indicators are great and they're good, but you might have something that's completely out of the normality of what you'd expect from a trading instrument that just can't be predicted from a technical standpoint. Uh, obviously, COVID's a great example, but but anything, you know, the company could have a profit warning. Um, there could be some big change in interest rates that impacts the way something is run. Uh, an unexpected change in management, the CEO could resign. And a lot of these events are kind of, difficult to predict but a lot of them you'll be more aware of if you kind of do the fundamental analysis as well so i would say that if you're primarily a technical investor always be aware of what fundamental things could come up are they significant will they move the share price in a way that technical indicators will struggle to predict that's the first thing second thing is relentlessly test the technical strategy to see how well it's worked in the past. As I said, nothing's an absolute. Some of these technical indicators are very, very useful. And I know a lot of people that have said that they work very well in improving their investment skill set. But again, you know, focus on what works. You know, don't get attached to one particular simple method. Um, some investments, they'll have, you know, very, very strong support and resistance lines, like the one with Southwest. Uh, others, they've had very, very reliable SMA trends. And you can see for the last five years, there might have been 12 crossovers of the lines and they've predicted every single time a stock price has gone up or down. But that's not always the case. And that's the other thing I would say is to really kind of see if they've worked in the past and only then think about executing the strategy, uh, because sometimes it works very well and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, if there's any other questions, then please let me know anything else to discuss. That'd be awesome. Uh, and then we can hand over to Catherine and she can deliver her half of this seminar. Again, <laughs> nothing, nothing yet in the comments, which is uh, surprising for once. It's normally a uh, jam packed with, with questions. I will say it's amazing to see uh, Amrit here. He's in the, he's in the, uh, in the room. Um, Amrit used to be a presenter last semester for these sessions, and he's now 
working with the UN for an internship in New York. So welcome back, Amrit. And um, yeah, Catherine, over to you. It's great to uh, it's great to have you on board. Your articles for our blog have been great so far on Forex, and uh, looking forward to to see you lead the session. So go ahead. Hi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, David, and thank you, Harry. I'm super excited to be here. Um, can you guys hear me, by the way? Is my microphone all right? Yep, yeah, great. Okay, awesome. Um, so um, I'm super excited to deliver this session, particularly because of what has happened in terms of Bitcoin today. I don't know if you guys seen, but it literally skyrocketed by about 13% in roughly 10 minutes, which is absolutely crazy. So uh, congratulations to anybody who has jumped on that rally because, you know, we made a lot of money there. <laughs> but um, I, in terms of fundamentals, I completely agree with Harry. Do always try to check out the news before, you know, in terms of technicals, we can't always predict what's going to happen and what happened with uh, Tesla and how they decided to purchase 1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin now and use that as a potential payment method. You know, that's what drove the price action upwards. Uh, from technical point of view, you know, we couldn't have predicted such output momentum, but, you know, we are not complaining at all. <laughs> But um, so now I'll just introduce myself for those who don't know me. Uh, I write blogs for the um, UOB Investor Org. Uh, I mainly cover technical analysis in Forex. Um, I have been trading Forex for about a year and four months now. I specialize in technical analysis, particularly price action. So uh, I know a lot of uh, the stuff Harry has covered today has been indicators and stuff like that. Um, I will focus more on you know, geometric shapes. I'll be just drawing a bunch of lines and, and squares on, on the chart. And, you know, hopefully you guys will be able to kind of <laughs> grasp where my thought process, you know, comes from when I do this analysis. I will use uh, tradingview.com for analysis. So then you guys can always go back to it and practice analyzing it yourself. Uh, like like David said, these, um, YouTube, these videos will be uploaded on YouTube, so you can always go back and check out what tools I've used and stuff like that, so it should be pretty good. So um, I'll just share my screen now. Okay. Okay, can you guys see my Bitcoin? Okay, I'm assuming that's a yes. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, so main thing with technical analysis is you always have to do a top down analysis, which essentially means you're starting with a, a higher time frame. Reason for this, by the way, with trading views is where you select your time frame. I don't really go monthly, but weekly, daily and so on. It's, it's you know, it's good. Um, the reason why you'd want to start with a higher time frame is because this is where, uh, you know, market movers operate with. This is like, you know, your banks, your hedge funds, anything in between, you know, your one hour, 30 minute time frames. This is just pretty much the noise, right? But we're going to use this noise to find a great entry point for us. Uh, particularly if you're using leverage, this is super important because the tiniest move can literally wipe out your account. So, this is this is important for everybody. Um, so when I first opened up this chart on a weekly time frame, the first thing I saw is obviously a very large upward momentum. So as you can tell, you know we are in a bullish market structure. Uh, here in January, we had two weeks worth of retracements, which you know if you looked at it from probably like a four-hour perspective, this would have been you know in a downward rally. But that's why it's important to view it in a context, right? Um, let's go to a daily chart now. Let me just clear the chart because I was doing some analysis there. Um, so this is a daily chart. And first thing I saw when I looked at it, and I don't know if some of you may have read my articles on UOB Investor Org, uh, but I automatically recognized a chart pattern here when I looked at it. I saw a huge upward rally and then a counter trend correction. This is precisely the criteria for a, um, for a flag pattern. What well, it suggests that there should be a sharp upward movement and then a uh, counter trend correction is uh, enclosed by two parallel lines. So we can see that's definitely the case here. Sorry, my trading view is acting all funny. I don't know why, but 
I guess you get the point, right? So I absolutely love this chat pattern just because uh, although you might feel like the output momentum is, you know, finishing, that's not the case. And we are looking for a very extensive outbreak to the upside, which often equals to the uh, to the length of the initial flagpole, which um, this is we're going to cover right at the end. It's going to uh, be about potential price projections, uh, where we what kind of prices we might be looking at if it continues going upwards. Um, but for now, let's just, um, I'm going to take you through my journey with cryptocurrency and, uh, you know, how I actually managed to double my account twice in the last two weeks. So I've done pretty well, uh, better than Forex, <laughs> because Forex is slightly different. Um, another chart pattern that I saw is uh, here. I like to call this the W because it's literally a W. Uh, people like to call this a double bottom, uh, completely up to you, it really does not matter. Your own appraisal of how the market moves, it, it doesn't matter, it's the numbers that speak for themselves. If you're making money, you know, you can see this in terms of herd mentality because each one of this candlestick represents, you know, buyers and sellers at any given moment. It doesn't matter, just make sure you deliver, right? <laughs> so we can see when we broke out of the W pattern, he actually retraced back to, um, this trend line, which is a very common occurrence. Um, so this is a perfect entry point for anybody, even from a daily uh, point of view. So this would be mostly for like investors and stuff like that. If you're looking for a long term investment, you know, this would be a great entry point for people using leverage or, you know, um, trading we can't operate from a daily chart the, the move is, is way too big so this is when we probably go to like an hourly chart and see what's going on there um so luckily this was exactly when i kind of entered the market uh roughly here that's when i looked at it i was like okay so what can i see from this point i know it's gonna go upwards now it broke out of a flag pattern you know we have that w formation it retraced back to the trend line it's great uh, so what else can I see? How can I enter? Um, and then I don't know if you guys can identify this trend, right? Well, this pattern, I actually covered that in my article as well. I feel like this one is very obvious. People call, call this the head and shoulders. This is the head and shoulders in reverse. And it's one of my favorite moves in the entire technical analysis world. Uh, as you can see, we've got a left shoulder right here, and then a further descent to create what's known the head, and then ascend back to uh, what's known the neckline. This acts as a resistance level here, and then the right shoulder. Um, and then you can see when it breaks out of this pattern, we can uh, the take profit will be roughly where the initial left shoulder has started, which is great because this is you know this move right here is a lot of money. Um, but as you can see, as we saw with the flag pattern, once it broke out, it actually retraced back to the neckline as well. So it's quite important to, um, you know, make sure that your stop loss uh, isn't too tight. Because if you if you put your stop loss right here, just below the neckline, you would have been taken out by this little wick right here. So it's important to give uh, any market, particularly crypto, uh, a leeway to kind of, you know, manifest itself. So as you can see, it rallied all the way up and it literally went where we kind of um, decided it was going to go according to that reverse head and shoulders. So at this point, I remember because um, I'm used to Forex, I don't do long term investments, right? I thought, you know, let me exit and let me re-enter on double leverage. Sorry, that's just what we do. Uh, forex traders, we're like controlling more currency than we can potentially afford. So I'll, so I exited roughly, I think, I think I woke up on the 4th of February and then I saw it drop from 106% uh, in profit to like 97%. And so I was like, you know what? This is clearly a retracement. Let me exit and, you know, re-enter on double leverage because I feel very confident about Bitcoin because Elon Musk fundamentals, that's back to Harry right there. Um, and here I saw that uh, W pattern that I spoke about before once again. But here, I misidentified it because like, like Harry said, you know, these patterns don't always play out as you'd expect them to. So when it broke out, I think I invested roughly here. And then as you can see, there is this neckline. 
And then when it retraced back to the neckline and I saw this bullish candle right here, I, was, I felt fairly confident uh, about you know upward movement uh, because I was like, right, it's it's normal for it to retrace and you know, and then for it to break out to the upside. But then I drew this trend line right here, as you can see, is being I don't know why my trading view is being funky. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Catherine, but, just, just in the meantime, sorry to interrupt. We had a, yeah. a couple of questions. Um, so firstly, what's the range of leverage that you use? Uh, what platform do you use to leverage yourself? And I guess just for anyone that doesn't know what leverage is, it might be worth explaining very simply if, if you can, and you don't mind. Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, so leverage is kind of like a loan you get from your broker, which allows you to actually control more, more currency than you can afford. I wouldn't use myself as an example because uh, I, I'm my risk aversion is very low. So I tend to I tend to go absolutely crazy. That's why for me entry point is very essential because as you can see this this for instance candlestick right here. Uh, with the leverage I use, which is something like times 30 a lot of the time, this would be minus, you know, 100 pounds or more. So that's why, you know, I can't afford to risk that kind of money. That's why I, you know, stare at charts 24 seven. Uh, but in terms of leverage, I definitely don't recommend using leverage. If you're using, um, do you know, I, I don't know if I can speak about this because I'm still in a process of, uh, of learning my own risk management. I may be good at technical analysis, risk management and personal psychology is whole another journey of its own, right? Uh, but I definitely wouldn't recommend placing any trades that are going to blow your account. <laughs> and this is, uh, this is not an issue for investors because investors, you're not likelihood is you're not using leverage at all is your you find a precise entry point you're putting your capital on the line and watch it steadily grow as you know as uh, as the stock gains in value whereas with traders you know we like moves like this this is great this can make us a lot of money um so, but because it's a small move if we were not to use that loan from a broker this let's say if i invested 200 pounds right here uh, and used no leverage at all this could be maybe like five pounds you know so when you use leverage you know it's good this could be 50 pounds which is great <laughs> so what were the other questions um hang on a second oh you just we've actually had a, another one from joe um which is when you make a trade do you set a stop loss or just use the liquidation price oh i definitely stop loss stop loss is extremely necessary uh because you you don't know what's going to happen do you do you want to like blow your account with like let's say this let, let's say if i was on times 30 leverage and i didn't have my stop loss placed uh, precisely here and then this candle happened and I, it was a, you know, 200 pound account with time 30 leverage, like I said, and this would have blown my account, you know, so always put your stop loss, even if you're investing, you know, what about if at a certain point it happens, I think Ethan, the vice president discussed it in the group chat the other day, you know, Bitcoin becomes, doesn't become regulated for so, by countries. So what do you think is going to happen? It's very likely it's going to collapse, especially if it's a big country like America or China, right? So fundamentals play a huge role here as well. Okay, great. Um, We've had a couple more questions, if, if you don't mind. Yeah, of course. <laughs> sure. Um, okay, firstly, we've got one from Henry, who is, I think, happy to ask it uh, himself. So, Henry. Mm -hmm. Sure. I was just wondering, um, have you ever considered, and again, I don't know what the, uh, what the current stance is with regards to cryptocurrency, but just wondered if you ever considered using options or derivatives to kind of help with your investment strategy? Because the two things you've got going on here, you've got, a lot of leverage but then also you want to do tight stop losses right to, mm. to protect your downside if you're ever wrong just wondered if you'd ever considered it because uh obviously the with the options you can leverage your position quite a lot but if you're buying the option if you think it's going to go up by a call you think it's going down by a put you've actually kind of created yourself a stop loss in terms of the most you can lose is the premium yeah, yeah. I was actually thinking about it so many times, but there is so much going on in the investment world. I literally don't know where to start. I know, so I'm getting there, uh, Harry. I promise. <laughs> Give me three months. I know, I'll less start doing less options. Huh? I know less and less every day. It's like the pie goes like tenfold and like your, your knowledge might go up 10%, but the pie doubles and you just realize that you know less and less, you know? Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. Every single day, I learn something new. I believe trading is a lifelong journey, so 
I haven't even got into the fundamental part yet, so I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, Henry, you, I think it was last week that you said, w w literally what you've just said now, that, you know, every every time you're learning more and more and you're reading more and more, and then you realise, actually, there's so much that I did not realise. Um, and, you know, on any given day, it's like, what do I do? Like, where do I start? And there's, there's just too much to, like, focus on. Um, we've had, like, a couple more questions, but I I'll ask you now, um, and then, I, yeah, we'll just keep going. Um, but very quickly... How long do you usually hold a position for? Uh, really depends. Uh, with cryptocurrency, it has been a day, maybe two. With Forex, uh, anywhere between, you know, six six hours to like, uh, you know, maybe 24 hours. Sure. Um, Ethan says, what platform do you use to trade Bitcoin? Binance. Binance, okay. And the last one is... Um, any good books or websites that you use to learn these specific technical patterns? Oh, a lot. <laughs> Honestly, this is a, you know, this is not like a single strategy. This is just observing charts for so long and then realizing that certain pa patterns just have higher probability of working out, you see? So I've read a lot of books, but a very particular recommendations, I cover all of that in my articles. So, you know, you can check those out on UOBinvest.org. And I think I recommended like five to six books there by now. So, yeah. Sure. All right. All right. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for answering all those questions. I'm sorry. If, um, yeah, if, if anyone's got any more, send them across and we'll get to them after. But feel free to, uh, to carry on with your demonstration. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> don't worry, I'm, I'm almost done. There's just two more entries. <laughs> so here, like I said, I saw this bullish candle after it broke out the pattern that retraced to the neckline. So I'm still fairly confident with my, uh, you know, with my trade at this point. However, I think I went on like a 15 minute chart. And then I saw this candle right here. And then I could tell they literally broke out to the downside. And with cryptocurrency, it's so much more volatile than Forex in so many ways. Because one of my friends, uh, he's been trading uh, Bitcoin for, you know, like three, four years now. And yeah, three, four years. And he said that in the, even in a bullish uh, market structure, the retracements in Bitcoin can, take, can be anywhere up to 30%. You know, 30% of the entire, you know, uh, cryptocurrency value seems like a lot to me and then forex that would be a completely whole new rally of its own um so i was scared about this so right here i already pulled out so i took a minus here uh, i don't know exactly how much um but yeah i left there and then i was like okay let me try to find another entry uh, so then i can go in with double leverage again and then I thought given, I would give it a couple of more hours maybe. Uh, but then I saw uh, this gorgeous candle. I know you guys were asking like, what, what what's a candle for? Uh, <laughs> candles are actually pretty great sometimes. Like this is one of my favorite candles right here. Uh, reason being is because by this point, if we can see a candle right next to it, it's having a wick on top. This indicates exhaustion of buyers, right? So all the candles from there onwards are supposed to have a, you know, a wick on top and, and start moving to the downside. However, here we can actually see uh, the buyers pushing price upwards. And the reason why this was so, uh, like I literally, I invested right here just because of this 15 minute uh, candle is because it was so close to this previous resistance levels. I thought if buyers were to drive the price up, the momentum was too much here to stop at this level right there. So I literally start trading just based off all of it, all of this candle right here. And as you can tell, it went all the way up and it was great once again. <laughs> so yeah, Bitcoin has been great, but Ripple has been horrible. Do not trade Ripple, guys. <laughs> but yeah, there was this um, whole upward momentum. Uh, yeah, right here. And I exited here too, uh, of shorter time frame, uh, something to do with like, you know, uh, you're breaking through, you know, like a trend structure and or something like that. And then I tried Ripple and then I was a minus. <laughs> and then I uh, revenge traded right here. And that played out so lucky for me because I, when I tell you, I literally started a trade right here and then it went all the way up there to 200% profit. And that just happened today. 
So that was great. But now I just like to say that I'm out of the out of the trade at the moment because I, like I said, I'm really scared of the retracements on Bitcoin. So I don't know what's going to happen here. So I'm out for now, but I'm happy with my profit. So yeah, is there any questions or anything you guys want to go over? Yeah, let me just check one second. Mm -hmm. um, bad one, do you trade ADA? Uh, ADA, is that the other cri cryptocurrency? <laughs> I think it is, yeah. Um, I don't, I don't. I got into crypto, cryptocurrency two weeks ago and I've mainly focused on Bitcoin and I thought I saw a good setup for um, Ripple yesterday. Everyone was telling me, do not do Ripple, do not do Ripple. I was like, but this is a great technical setup. Come on, you guys. And yeah, they were completely right. It took me out. So I don't know if I'll stick with the cryptocurrency market. We'll see. I'm enjoying my forex at the moment. <laughs> sure. Um, I guess one question would be, look, we've got 70 people uh, in the audience right now. They wanted to get into technical analysis. What would be the one piece of advice you'd say to start off with? Uh, with technical analysis, read my articles. Because I actually go from basics. I cover just basic market structure, you know, like ascending zigzag is a bearish market structure, sorry, bullish market structure, and then support resistance. And then you kind of combine all of those together and you can tell so much just from, you know, a couple of lines in the chart. Sure. Um, I'm going to link in in a minute uh, the link to our blog and you can subscribe and you'll get all of Catherine's articles straight to your email inbox automatically uh, which I highly recommend because the articles are great and they are really great for beginners um, just a couple more about crypto we've had one from Amy which is what's your opinion on Dogecoin and from uh, all I can see is AK which is what do you think about Ethereum as well right um so dogecoin that's a, is a dogecoin that that's a funny one isn't it i think it was like 40 percent up a certain point or something like that so that came completely out of nowhere um i'm in this group chat with like investors who kind of this that's what they do for a living uh so they're kind of laughing about what's going on with the dogecoin where did it come from i think even elon made a tweet about it today or something um just make you know <laughs> having a laugh at what's going on with, the, with that cryptocurrency so i have no idea but do i wish i invested in it yesterday yes absolutely so i have no idea and the other one you mentioned the other crypto oh yeah i only did ripple and bitcoin i don't know anything else <laughs> sure um i guess one question that i have is with you know it's great that you've got all these technical setups but how does it affect you when you've got someone like Elon Musk tweet out of nowhere um, and it just kind of, I assume, puts everything that you've got in place out the window, right? How do, how do you react to that? Um, a lot of times uh, they actually converge. Sometimes I feel like the market moves in ways where uh, the biggest news releases get released at precisely the point where there's meant to be a change direction anyway. Like, for instance, if we take the example of Bitcoin today and what happened with a Tesla purchasing Bitcoin, uh, you know, it was already a bullish market structure. So majority of, you know, very, I don't think people were selling Bitcoin at any point. So, so a lot of people were happy about this. And similar um, with Forex, actually, apart from stuff like non-farm payrolls and stuff like that, because they, because as soon as that gets released, first, you know, one hour, the market doesn't know what it's doing because there is current, indirect currency correlation. So, you know, if something affects US dollar, it might affect, you know, like um, Australian dollar as well because of like an indirect influence on oil and stuff like that. So I don't know. <laughs> All right. Um, well, look, Catherine, thank you so much for that and thank you to henry as well uh, both your presentations were absolutely fantastic and very insightful and um as we've mentioned several times now they will be available to rewatch on youtube um if you've got any questions for catherine or henry i assume you're both more than happy to receive them on on whatsapp or on on the group chat yeah no yeah. maybe yeah. um sure i'm gonna pass over to ethan now quickly who is gonna do the um name generator for the giveaway for the book and very quickly, whilst Ethan is setting that up, I'm going to put all the links to our social media, blog, anything that we've got going on in the, in the chat now. Um, 
So if there's anything that you're not a part of, go subscribe, like, follow, whatever, whatever it is that you can do on any of these things, uh, go do that because we, we really appreciate it. And as of last week, was it Ethan? We hit 500 members, um, yep. which was the most incredible thing, you know, to officially become the biggest society on campus. Um, it's amazing the community we've built and, you know, every session we're seeing new people join, uh, new names hit tonight. So firstly, thank you so much for your support. And yeah, secondly, Ethan, take it away. Sure. So as usual, every week we have a book giveaway. And during the session, I've put all the names um, in this you know, random name wheel. So I'm just going to click uh, go and good luck to everyone. And if you don't win, go buy the Tower Trading anyway on Amazon. Fantastic book. So Joanna Guilford, congratulations. Um, please get in contact with me, Henry or David, and we'll be in contact very, very soon. Right, Amazing. That's it for me. Congrats, Joanna. Um, <laughs> the last thing that we're going to say before we, we uh, end the session for tonight is tomorrow. We've got an incredible guest speaker, I hope. Um, he is the global head of internal credit trading at JP Morgan and he is Neil Hamburger and he's had loads of experience in trading. Um, you know, to be global head is huge. And he's going to share his experience uh, working at JP Morgan, talking about his career, uh, I guess, advice for you guys. And um, yeah, feel free to ask him any questions that you've got tomorrow. So make sure you come along. It's at 8 p.m. Um, same Zoom link as this, as always. And next week we have, as Henry mentioned before, we've got... Um, professionals coming in to actually give the investing one-on-one -on -one session so it's not going to be henry or catherine next week it's going to be uh some hedge fund managers from a company called upside technologies that we're partnered with who are incredibly amazing they're going to put everything simply for you and i think they're going to go into a bit more technical analysis and a bit more about managing your finances a portfolio management um so definitely be there for that that's going to be monday again 6 30 but yeah see you tomorrow night 8 p.m for neil hamburger and thank you again henry and catherine for an incredible session have a great night guys